All right, we'll get started here. So first, on the agenda, it looks like everyone's here. Mary Jo's coming through through phone call. Um, the first thing, making sure again, everyone has the agenda I sent out to them and we're able to review the minutes. Thumbs up is all I need. Sweet. Yeah. And then, <laughs> all right, sweet. Um, Just and, testing, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, because I'm, I'm going to mute me and then I'll come back in. Okay, all right, thanks. All right. Um, has everyone reviewed the minutes and agreed to approve them? See some shaking hands. <laughs> That's good. All right. Um, so first on the agenda, second, I guess, second on the agenda for the reschedule, the public hearing for the conditional use permit and sign legislation was originally scheduled for April 18th uh, at 7 p.m. I talked with Mr. Mosby earlier, and I think we both agreed um, kind of to reschedule it to a later date. Um, I wanted to know if everyone would rather reschedule it or if you would be interested in doing like an online forum, I, however that would work out. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. I would think it should probably be rescheduled at this point. All right. I, I would agree with that reschedule. All right, yeah, I would also agree that we think we should reschedule it. Um, any ideas Ideas we might want to reschedule for right now? Next uh, year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I want to put tentatively maybe June, hopefully, if everything's over by then. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. I was just going to say we should probably wait until May so that we can really look at what's happening right. with our state and then I can work with you to set up a uh, an alternate date. All right we'll leave it on for May then um, on the agenda till May and see where we are hopefully at that point. Um, so then next I did send out to everyone an email that I, we did receive a response from the law department, uh, law director, about the um, uses for conditional, for restricted funds, for like um, the streets and st street levy fund. And it does say that we can use traffic signs. I know we talked about it uh, last meeting about getting some entrance streets up, and we then talked about um, kind of an overall branding or how we want to move forward. So I want to kind of discuss that more with everyone. What do we want to see? Um, what is what do you think the first initial step should be for an overall branding of NCH? Don't be too fast. No, we're all jumping in here. Um, well, I think kind of, I guess my thoughts, I'll go first as I was thinking maybe some sort of task force um, to kind of, you know, with the administration, uh, mayor, some people from council and especially, you know, the, you know, community leaders as well, trying to get an idea of what branding we should have. Um, any input from administration? Sure, for my, you know, for my two cents worth, but um, I do think, honestly, one of the most important things, even before you get to the step of branding, is to come to a, a common understanding of mission and purpose. Okay. Um, and I think that that really has to, has to be done by council. Council has to be able to provide that. And then once we have that uh, understanding, then the branding will be able to match, you know, what, what, why we exist basically, or what we're trying to accomplish, where we want to go. Um, so for my two cents, that's, what I would, that's what I would contribute. Okay. Um, Amber, I know that we discussed, I think last year about the comprehensive annual or, uh, plan. I don't remember exactly the naming for it. Do you, do you remember where we are at the same place with that? 
So with the comprehensive plan last year, we did um, talk about that in depth. Um, we applied for the Duke, Duke grant to redo our comprehensive plan. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get those funds. And so what happened was is then Hamilton County stepped in, Brian Wamsley, and said that he would help do the CIC strategic plan as far as businesses and the CIC goes. But our comprehensive plan is something that we definitely, definitely need to redo and go through. Um, I think the last one was done in the 80s or, or no, I guess it was early 2000s maybe. It had to be in early 2000s, like, so. All right, um, you know, maybe the next steps then since we wanna get an overall plan is maybe schedule a working session with everyone here um, and then invite other members of council to come and just start hammering through it to make sure we can finish it. So I know that's something we would, you know, we could thought we could get to last year, but never got to it. So, Mr. Yeah. Sorry. So typically with the comprehensive plan, Christian, I mean, normally what happens is, is it gets contracted out um, just because something that big with everything from revenues to expenditures to um, infrastructure, parks, everything has to be looked at by a third eye that it's kind of like, it's kind of like our, our Bible, if you will, like running a city. Um, I know last year when we were talking to people, they, we were talking about 40 to $50,000 for a new comprehensive plan. So. Yeah, I know normally, you know, comprehensive plans are definitely third parties. Um, and it does take a significant amount of time, a lot of input from lots of stakeholders. Um, Mr. Mosby, did you have something you wanted to share? Well, yes, yeah, I was actually going to say, I, I think that Ms. Bailey, you know, hit the nail on the head when she mentioned Brian Walmsley. We have a, we have a point of contact at Hamilton County and I've been in touch with him, you know, since I've been in this position, I have talked to him about this very thing and I do think it would be wise to really have a very candid conversation uh, with Mr. Walmsley, even before we start jumping out to, to say that, you know, this is what we want, this is what we would like to do. Um, because I do think that the input that Mr. Walmsley provides will, I think it can be very enlightening and to help us you know, with, uh, with next steps, uh, if, if that is the way that council wants to proceed. All right. All right. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that. I think we can, I can reach out to him and we can try to sit down and, and get him maybe either at a next meeting or just through an email um, chain just to kind of figure out where the next steps about the comprehensive plan should be. Um, and then, I mean, other than that, I did want to talk more about just kind of an overall getting signs up, even if we don't have a specific branding, because I really do want to see some type of entrance signs. It doesn't need to be, you know, a specific brand to it, but just a simple welcome to North College Hill, you know, established, I just forgot the year, we established 1916, correct? Is that Correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone? It became incorporated in 19, well, in 1916, yes. Yeah. 1941, it became a city. Yeah, so established 1916. Something just simple like that, just a welcome sign so that we actually can just start making um, us having a name as you drive through so people know that they're entering a different municipality. Um, so I th that is something that I do want to see. Um, and Mr. Mosby, I'd like to see, you know, if you could bring us something, a quote, a bid or something showing us those so now that we know we can use street funds for these i'd like to see some type of movement on getting some you know signage up yeah i can i can do that i, I guess the only thing i don't disagree with that i i think my only concern would be right now is you know as far as us using our funds and where we are in particular with this mm -hmm. coronavirus yeah. um you know, and, and if council says that that's a priority, then absolutely. Um, but I do want to make sure that at least right now, we are taking care of the, the highest priorities 
you know, as far as our budget is concerned. That's another discussion that we can have in the finance committee meeting. Yeah. But I, that's the only caution that I would bring to that. Yeah, I'm not, that, we not can saying get that I want to spend money now. I would just want to know what the cost would be, I guess, if right. we move forward. Mr. Chair? Yes. But given that these are special funds that we can use, I don't think that we can alleviate very much from our general fund to funnel these through these. So Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm not disagreeing with you, Amber, because I know it is, you know, it's restricted funds. So I do think um, there's possibility we use it. I just want to know how much it would really cost for us to put some signs up. You know, if it's a thousand dollars, is that something that we think is worth it? You know, if it's ten thousand dollars, you know, definitely want to reconsider how much some, you know some signage would be. Yeah, it won't be ten thousand. I'll assure you. <laughs> yeah, that was an exaggeration. I would hope. Well, not, you know. well, Mr. Chair. I mean, I we use some real fancy signs like Green Townships. So. Yeah, yeah, I do know somebody that has one of those. Um, and Miss Mary Jo, you know what I'm talking about? Those cool like signs that the digital signs that scroll across. Like, I do know someone who has one of those for sale, for cheap. So, just saying. What size is it? Huh? What size is it? What size is the sign? I think is what she's asking. Yeah, yeah roughly I'm gonna go. Roughly I'm gonna go with three foot by five foot. Yeah, something about that size. Yeah, they I tried think to we've talked it. about secondary entrances as well. Maybe like a, you know, 12, 12 inches by twelve inches, something like that. On like, what did we say? Yeah. Well, I think we talked about approximately six entry points. Yeah. Um, into North College Hill, so. I can, you know, like we said, I, I can look at that. And I, I think uh, actually a, either a, uh, uh, probably a, you know, a, a three by five, that, that would definitely, that's a pretty big sign. That would be a nice, that would be a nice size. So. All right. I think that kind of hits that point pretty well. Any other discussion, comments? All right, um, next I have identifying locations for a dog park. Uh, I didn't know if anyone had some ideas of where they would like to see a dog park. Again, just kind of limiting the conversation. Oh, hold on here, my computer's like going really dark. Kind of limit the conversation to just ideas, you know, not talking about funding or anything like that right now, just kind of if you wanted to place a dog park somewhere, where would you want to see it in, in NCH? Did you cue that dog bark on just like that? that I'm awesome. that good. <laughs> awesome. So I know uh, last time we talked about uh, Clover Knoll, no Clover, what's the school? Clover Knoll. Oh, Clover Knoll, yeah. Is that what I'm thinking of, Mary Jo, the place over off Simpson? What is that? Becker. Becker. Thank you. That's school property. Yeah, I, I know it is. That's just an idea. It's kind of a where we could even possibly have a dog park. What about the other half of Bets? Uh, Veterans Park. So you're talking about on the other side? Yeah, you know, the one side we have like the playground area and then we have that green space right there. What about in that green space? I know it. But that's really at a dip though, isn't it? Like. Yeah, I mean, that would be considered like, I think we were talking about last time, like one of those micro dog parks. So, and that's definitely doable. Um, there's just different challenges with it, with micro dog parks instead of having like an acre or so of land for another size. What about behind the city center? Uh, I don't know. Mr. Mosby, comments on having a dog park back there? Well, I mean, directly behind the city center, of course, is is our property. Um, but then right next to that, of course, is <laughs> Clovernook Center for the Blind property. Yeah. So um, I think when you and I had talked about this, I was trying to get an idea of how many acres that we were looking at. So to give you, just to kind of give you a comparative size, if you look at Pies Park, Pies Park, I believe, is 
two, I think it's two point, I think it's approximately 2.6 acres. Okay. Yeah. So the, I did send out a study to everyone basically completed by another city when they were looking into putting in a dog park. Um, and they came up with basically a good sized dog park is anywhere between one to five acres of land. Um, that was their minimum recommendation to have like a larger size dog park. Um, but there was discussion, like I said, of these micro dog parks less than basically half an acre and as small as, as a quarter of an acre. So, you know, if you're looking at a quarter acre size, that would probably be about the size of that piece of land where Veterans Park is on the other side of it. So there, like, <laughs> there's different challenges there. The other thing you have to think about is making sure that there's water for dogs, there's parking that's available, um, or some, excuse me, the main concerns with it. Mary Jo, you made it in. I don't know if I can hear you. I don't know where mute is. <laughs> um, other than that, like I want to know from everyone, what do you think the next steps are for you know even discussing more about dog park? Because I think right now with the budget, we are just really limited. Um, Mr. Chair, once again, just for what it's worth, I, obviously the ideas are are good ideas, but I do think that they would need to be coordinated. That's where I think the idea of the comprehensive plan really comes into play. Yeah, because by doing that, then we could look overall and look at how you know, those types of projects might also be able to be phased in to a, to a redevelopment, you know, a, a larger redevelopment project. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, I think really, I agree with that. I would think that would make sense. We do really need to have a comprehensive plan. Um, I think we'll just move on to the tree city. I know. Amber um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Has does okay. I know that I have one. Um, does anybody else have a copy of the comprehensive plan? Like, I know everybody up here is pretty much like a, a digital user, but if you haven't read the comprehensive plan and read it, you probably should. And I don't know, is it still available on our website? And I has, don't remember right now. I'd have to go back okay. and look to see if it is. Does anybody ha like have a copy of it, or? I I had I had a digital copy of a couple of different plans similar to that, and I'm standing here looking and I can't find it. I'll continue to look and see what I have if I can find something, but I'm not sure at this point. Oh, and yes, we do have one in the office to, to answer Miss Bailey's uh, question. So you have you we do have one in the office. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a pretty thick copy. Yes, it, it is. Yeah, um, I know what. If worst case scenario, Mr. Mosby, if we can't find it digitally, I I may have it. Um, does anybody want a copy of it to read it? I mean, so yeah, I'll the copy, a copy definitely. Okay, like, I would like a. Yeah, because it kind of copy as well. I'm just, um, is there any way you can scan the copy that you have? <laughs> it, it's, it's like when I say, I don't, when I say Bible, I know that's offensive, but it's like in paper terms, like it's literally everything. I mean, there is a lot of Miss Mary Jo fluff in our current comprehensive plan, but <laughs> it is everything from demographics to future plans. Like it's, it's like a novel, but I don't saying we, we don't have a scanner. <laughs> I'm, oh. No, we have a scanner. It would just take a little time to get it in, but I, okay. I suppose we could, I suppose we could certainly do that. And then, you know, once we get that finished, it would be able to be available, you know, um, in a digital format, but it'll take a little while to get it done. And multiple emails, because again, it's, it won't fit into one PDF by any means. All right. Uh, anything else? All right. Um, so the next is the uh, Tree City USA. I believe 
um, after you know talking with Amber and looking up, it looks like we meet all the requirements, <laughs> except for a couple things that we need to pass uh, along to become a Tree City USA. Um, we do meet the minimum amount of per capita spending on trees with our most recent uh, budget that has passed. Um, I believe the next portion, Amber, would be the tree board. Yes, we need to create a tree board. Um, based off of the Arbor Day Foundation and tree board website, there is no minimum amount of members that I can see that has to be on said tree board, but we do have to create a tree board. So um, I believe there's legislation already on their website, correct, to do all of this. Yeah, there's okay. literally a copy and paste ordinance. It's just the only thing that kind of that we're going to have to fill in is how many members and how do they get on said tree board. Is there uh, is I, any takers on what we should, who we should put on the tree board or who should be a part of it? I'm cool with five random people that send in an application, like, <laughs> if we can or we five. drive around and knock on people's doors and say, hey, you have a great yard, it's you, like, want to do this? <laughs> I have Mr. A, Hedger, as I mentioned to uh, you earlier, you know, I, I do think that one thing, and it may, you don't need to have everybody, but we should have somebody on there with some kind of Arbor experience, Arbor yeah. knowledge. Um, and even if we don't find that person in the city, perhaps that is one of the you know, qualifications that we can use to say the person doesn't have to be a resident, but they should have some tree knowledge, some, some significant tree knowledge or experience. Yeah, no, okay. I would agree with that. So one expert. Has um, anyone I, reached out to the chiropractor on Hamilton? He's a, I believe he's an arborist. The chiropractor on Hamilton? Is, is Hayfley. Hey, hey, H-A-F-L-E-Y is my best guess at the spelling of his name. Jim oh. O'Shea said like I'm spelling it wrong, but, um, and I probably am, but it's something like that. He's a chiropractor. It's right, right there on Hamilton. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. So what if we did, what if we did five? We did a professional, okay. um, like a council appointee, a mayor appointee and two resident electors, like just two residents that. Do you, like what is what's the criteria? What what would that individual do? What were the responsibilities? They would develop all of that. Yeah. So well, I think if they have, they well, have I think Mary Jo, one tree. of the things that they would do is we would look at a. They would develop, for example, a tree policy for the city. Um, they would look at, actually, Mr. Hedger and I were talking about this. They would be the ones that kind of look at and create a plan for planting trees, where we should plant the trees. Because quite frankly, um, not to go into anything too long about it, but you know, we have some trees that are in kind of the right of way, uh, but some of those trees are clearly too big for the, for the, the property. Uh, where they are. So we need to plant the right trees um, in, in the area. And so the, that those would be the things that they would be responsible for. The, that board could also determine that would actually, I, I like the idea because we could then take, um, you know, we have certain trees that may have problems and we could take those pro we could take those problem trees to the tree board and they could say, you know, what we should do with those. And then by, by doing that, because right now we do currently use a professional arborist to come in and make judgments about whether or not a tree should be taken down. Uh, that's something that the tree board can do as well. Or what if we do three arborists? Like we find three professional landscaper arborists. I don't know, like. You better know if you can find three before you put that in the legislation. <laughs> right, like. Um, I think another good idea would be also to maybe reach out to the horticulture program at UC at DAP. Um, I know there's a lot of, I know several of the students who actually went there. So that would probably be a good idea. 
And then maybe we could also talk to, to be honest with you, we might also be able to talk to Parks and Recreation um, at the City of Cincinnati, the Park yeah. Board, because we might be able to get some recommendations from there as well. All right. So I heard definitely we want an ex we want experts. Um, so definitely at least one expert, a council appointing and mayor appointing the two resident elects. Do we want to in the name right now? You just said three experts. Is there any opinion on who? Just trying to create a board with yeah. odd numbers. So I mean, I like the first plan. I think that would work. Maybe one expert. Just yeah, maybe one to two, maybe two experts. So there's some difference in opinions. So in theory, two experts, one admin, one council, and then one, one resident one. elector. Yeah. All right, um, I can work on getting the ordinance, making sure that it's filled in basically um, and sending that over to everyone and then also to Dieters. And then um, we can, if anyone knows anyone that they might think would be good for this, you know, please send them uh, my information so we can, you know, get that ball rolling. Other than that, Amber, is there anything else I'm missing on this? Yeah, we need a proclamation. Yeah, I, I know there's that por portion still left, so. Yeah, if I just, I guess I'll email everybody the proclamation. And then of course we have to pay the membership fee, but. How much is that? I don't know, I have to look at the website. Ballpark. Less than a hundred? Uh, maybe, I can tell you in just a second. I don't remember. It's not that bad, though. We do have a tree guy right on the boy though, near, near uh, Bison. We do. And then we have another guy right over here on um, Galbraith and what's the first one? Past the car wash, Diana, maybe. Um, I can get back to you on the membership. It's not that bad by any means, so. I think we also have to have a budget worksheet too. We do, but I think that we already, I think we're good with that. Yeah, well, it has to be filled out, but I can work on that. It's not an issue. Extrapolate, yeah. You got that. I'm trying to find it. Me too. I know it's on here, but I thought it was on the application, but I don't see it. Yeah, I don't see it either. So I think we'll just get back to it, um, and I'll get that information to everyone. I'll send it out um, with a more fully developed plan. All right, so next on the agenda, I know uh, last year we had a really big success with suicide, suicide prevention month. Um, I know that to be able to get that passed, I know Ron, you said you wanna get it passed at least by, you said August, correct? Right, last year it was passed April, May, um, but we, we have already been meeting and planning for it. And one of the things that the 
team agreed upon was that the closer it is to the actual month, the more relevant the resolution becomes. Um, and so we uh, felt that if, as long as it's passed in August, that would be, that would be fine. That's the month before the, you know, the suicide prevention awareness month. All right. And since there's only one meeting in June, July, and August, as long as it gets on the agenda for the first reading in June, that should be fine. All right, um, Ron, can you get us the, I guess, revised uh, legislation for that? Or Amber, do you have it? I do, yeah. Um, I will forward that to everybody right now. I'll make sure that we get it to council by June. Yeah, um, Joel Frieder is the guy that actually got me involved with this and the reason why this whole thing was passed last year will actually be here July 20th. So, um, I don't know what we want to do, but he's, he's the guy, Jim, I think you actually brought it up, Jim, last year, the guy that uh, wrote the Chicago Tribune article, Joel, he'll be here July 20th at 50 West the Brewery for like a educational piece, but he really wants to come to North College you know, and hang with us. So I'll get that over to everybody. The new proclamation. 2020. Christian, I mean, did you want me to give an update on where we are? Uh, for the benefit of the committee? Yeah, if you have any updates, you said you were talking about it. Yes. Um, basically, we've been meeting since January. Um, so there are a couple of things. Number one, normally there would have been a NAMI walk in May. Um, obviously, I think at this point it's going to be postponed. But just for future event, that's one of the things that we wanted to tie into as well, to partner with NAMI and actually have a contingent of uh, people from the community uh, that would be able to participate in that walk, which is, uh, which is scheduled or was scheduled for the second weekend in May. We are actually going to, uh, at this particular point, we're planning to reduce the number of programs to four. So basically we would have one a week that we're going to focus on. This time, instead of all of them being in the evening, we want to, we want to distribute it a, a little more evenly. So we are planning um, at least one during the day. Uh, that way we can you know, get some of the seniors involved as well. Um, so we, we do have, and then the other thing is we are, I've already reached out to our surrounding communities and let their, those administrators know they've been on board as far as supporting us. Um, and then we're also, I think we're, we're trying to get more of the word out to the churches as well. So I'm, I'm hopefully we'll have more churches involved uh, this time around as well. Now, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mosby, is that um, similar to the warrior run that they have every year in September? Um, are you familiar with that? I am not, but the NAMI walk is usually scheduled at Sawyer Point. It is the main it is pretty much the main fundraiser for NAMI. Um, oh, okay. And and they and they they hold it once a year, but uh, we were talking about initially, perhaps having a uh, a team with co captains, uh, one one co captain from the school board, another from you know council. But obviously, this has kind of changed the plans pretty drastically for that. Um, so, so the Warrior Run is actually an anti suicide. Um, run that they have every year in September. Um, they have a website. I believe that the date for this year is September 26th. Um, and it's, it's a pretty large event. They have one group of people that walk and then another group of people that run and they raise money, that kind of thing. That's something that maybe we can get involved with, uh, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think if we could somehow get that with the suicide prevention, what, when did you say it was? I'm sorry. It's in September. And if you, there is, they do have a website. It's, um, if you Google, uh, warrior run one, one N is in Nancy and then the number five, one N five, um, 
you'll find the website and you can kind of read some more about it. And um, I know about it because uh, a friend of mine uh, who is currently a judge actually lost his son uh, to suicide uh, a few years ago. So um, um, a lot of us last year got involved um, on his team uh, and it, you know, was very well attended. So that might be something that, you know, we could uh, become involved with and hopefully it's far enough away that, you know, all this will, you know, the COVID will not impact that at all. Yeah, hopefully. All right, yeah, I can research that and look into it and see what we could possibly get involved with. I think that's a good idea. Anything else? Um, so next, I know that we didn't really get to discuss it uh, last meeting, and it's been a while. I mentioned at our last meeting at the very end about creating a beauty salon district similar to the bridal district that's in Reading. Um, I know there was someone, I can't remember who mentioned something about a task force, and I thought that was a good idea, um, especially to get the business uh, leaders involved um, in it, and also having some people from the city also involved. And then Jim, since you're here, someone from the um, chamber. Struggle. From the chamber? Yes, the chamber. Thank you. Um, so thinking of a task force, um, does anybody at first have initial questions about the beauty salon district from what I sent out to everyone? I actually do, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Yeah. Um, so for for a, a beauty salon district would you be would the goal be to put all of the beauty salons and those kinds of businesses in the same area or is or would it be something different well thankfully most of them are already in the same area um there are most of them are located you know on the business district on galbraith you know there are a couple that are located off of hamilton um, but I don't, you know, have no intention of trying to move any business to a different location. The only thing I, the intention is to hopefully embrace what businesses are already here in North College Hill, instead of trying to, you know, change them, which I don't see happening. And it is something that's you know, unique for North College Hill. And I think if we can highlight that, it will, you know, be able to build up a sense of community within North College Hill, along with giving us some identity. Mr. Chair, were you looking for a specific zone uh, or zoning code for that district? No, I think that would mostly, the zoning code, I think is mostly handled in the conditional use permit that we're uh, holding public hearings for. So this would be just for, mostly for, you know, advertising, reaching out to businesses, uh, creating, um, let's see, the possibility for a tax relief program, um, a website for the businesses to be able to use to make sure that they're all uh, be able to use that uh, some type of media or social media campaign just to get the word out i know that you know the bridal district does have you know a website they have where all the businesses are located they have maps they have um, several different murals out that help direct people um, and then also signage so i think if there's something that we can focus on that and try to, you know, help build those businesses. I think that will only, you know, improve North College Hill. Uh, Mr. Pre Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I think too with that, you have to, um, generally people only go to beauticians or barbers that they know, trust. You can do word of mouth, that, which is good, but I think we need to do some type of something that will draw them here uh and even if we campaign let's say for instance i'm just throwing this out there if there were a building or something we get a beautician or a barber to go in here and say your home of the 20 dollars haircut of the 30 dollars wash and dry we i mean all of you may not know but um it can well for females i know it can be really expensive sometimes to get a haircut to get a trim so i'm looking more like things and i think in in order to draw it 
maybe I don't know where if we had somewhere where we can do a hair show and we talk to those those beauticians in our area and these are the ones who highlight <clears throat> because we want the people to come here so we get those with beauticians and barbers in our area and we do a hair show no i think that's a great idea that was um daphne kind of she's kind of said the same thing my wife um she also you know discussed about having some type of fair beauty show something to highlight and draw people and i completely agree um because we have to draw them in i i yeah. i'm gonna be honest i don't use any of the beauticians here i don't i may see a couple people who do their with their work but uh, i have to be drawn there so I think that's my concern. What are we going to do? It's okay to be a beauty district, but what are we going to do to draw people here? Because, you know, if I go to the bridal district, I know it's one shop in that entire bridal district that carries prom dresses. I can't yeah. go to any other dress, you know. So what do we do to get him to come here? So if we had a shop to say, we can't make them do it, but, you know, I'm thinking we have to draw them in to get people to come if you just need your hair done, the shop of no wait, <laughs> no appointment necessary. Well, I think, hours, uh, you know. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience with going to beauty salons. <laughs> so um, I think you make an excellent point. And I think you'd be great to be involved in the task force. I'm uh, sure you do think that. I'm you know, sure being, you do. <laughs> especially being a woman um, and. <laughs> <laughs> I could be that. a man and you would say I think you'd be great. <laughs> I think you'd be great to do it. Um uh, I think you know, I think that's an excellent idea. So I think kind of the next point is just creating some type of task force and some type of meeting system to where we can <laughs> reach out with the businesses. Um would kind of be the next step and I can, you know, put put together some type of either motion, resolution, whatever you want to do um so you create that um so we can move forward because i i think it's a great idea and i think you know we could really help the businesses that are here i think that the hair show sounds like a great idea yeah i think we're, now we, now we just need a location <laughs> so. i think that i think that the hair show is awesome i do think too though christian like we should try to like I don't know, send them a nice piece of stationery and invite them in the current yeah. salons yeah. and say like, hey, this is what we're looking at as far as, and this is something that would be in our comprehensive plan because like the bridal district, dude, that's huge. Like, Oh, it is huge. Yeah, it draws a lot of people in from all over Cincinnati and tri-state area, so. You have to wonder who you want to cater to. Who do you want to cater to? I mean, because uh, you're talking about in the beauty industry, there's women who, specialize and we don't have it here and the only one other shop that i knew existed was the north side and it closed for uh, african-american women with natural hair who doesn't use any chemical there was a shop in north side it closed i don't know where she went so you have uh beauticians who just braid hair uh like add the extensions you have some that just uh specialize and uh weave hair weaving so you know i think first we need to know our client we need to you know i know a little bit about some of them but i'm gonna be honest i don't know what all of them do and i'll tell you and, and i just found out if you can go to school and take a class just to be able to shampoo and braid in a shop and you don't need license and i didn't know that i thought everybody who you know did things inside of a shop so you know just knowing what's here and what they're doing because a lot of them i'll be honest lately i've seen with no clients just the building sitting there yeah. so i think if we uh if, if we do some you know reach out to them I, i'm sure that they will be very receptive they would especially for um, hair to hair. something that would draw people in and um and, and I'm also certain that, and I don't know a whole lot about the industry, but I gotta think that if, you know, if they, if they can do something where they, you know, just to get people in the door to, to know that they would do a good job. Cause I'm like, I'm like the mayor. If, if I'm not familiar with you, I don't want your hands in my head. So <laughs> I would, you know, I would want to, 
to, you know, kind of see their work or, or, you know, see what kind of work they do or something. So, yeah. you know, so, I, mean, I, I, to them. I definitely get where <laughs> you guys are all coming from. And I also, from just kind of initial research looking into it, 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 you know, the majority of all the shops had, you know, really good reviews, at least on Google and a couple other, like, um, I guess, hair salon sites, um, like hundreds that all had, you know, lots of reviews and they were all like four to five star rating. So, you know, I think we do have some good shops here located and some, I think obviously some do better than others. Um, but I agree, I think, you know, reaching out to them is kind of maybe the first step and seeing what kind of response we get. Um, I can, I can write up some type of letter or stationary or maybe uh, Ron, if you could write up some type of letter. I don't know what, what we, who would, wants to write it up and you know, just the first initial step of reaching out. I, I could help with that, Christian. I'm, All right, I'm, 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 I don't have a problem helping with that. I, I'm familiar with two of the barber shops because, you know, I, I would, took, you know, I took my son there, but you know, the problem is that they're so crowded and overbooked and I'm just not a fan of, you know, sitting around in a place for hours. <laughs> and hours. And, and hours. And hours. <laughs> Where, you know, people realize like, hey, are you a lawyer? I have a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So I think we can work on that and then, you know, we'll send it out to everyone and hopefully get some good response. Amber, I know you had one last thing that you wanted to discuss. Um, yes, but, yes, but before we get there, guys, I'm so sorry. I know like you can hear like my kid laughing and being crazy. I apologize. Like if you see me mute this and stop my video it's literally to tell my five-year-old that hey you're up from a nap now great but i haven't heard him at all amber i haven't, I haven't. oh Whew, i'm surprised okay cool okay so um yeah the other one um was night on the town national night out i'm sorry so national night out is kind of like it's kind of like a blog party well it's whatever we wanted to make it to be where we invite the community and the police department to like a party, a, a gathering. Um, they're going with October 6th this year. It's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, I think McDonald's and Starbucks so far has signed up to help co-sponsor it. Um, municipalities around the world do it and started in 1984. I think it's something that we should do. What was that? They used to have something when my kids were little um, that was on Galbraith. Are you talking that, about the Fireman's Festival? Maybe? maybe that's what it was. It was, they had like a bouncy house and the fire truck was out there. The kids could get on the fire truck. They had a police car out there. And um, it, it, it seemed to me like it was similar to National Night Out, but I don't know what, I don't remember what it was. I just used to take my kids to random stuff. But this was, this has to be 15 years ago that this was going on in North Palo Chill. Pro it, was, I would, it was on Galbraith. It was like, and it was, it was very well attended. There was music. They um, still do that up in gosh. Forest Park. I'm, I'm not sure. If, if it was the national night out that I'm thinking about, which was in August in the past. It, it, uh, it typically is the first Tuesday in August. However, with the COVID, they're rolling it back to October this year. Okay. It's called the Rona, Amber. The Rona. The Rona, right. The COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Mount Healthy does that national night out every year. Quite a few neighborhoods uh, do the national night out. I've um, when I was campaigning, I actually went to quite a few of them around uh, Hamilton County. So, it, it I know it's very it's something that's um, it it is done a lot around. Um, I know Colerain Township, Green Township, um, uh, Cheviot trying to think of areas around here that I went to. 
So I guess what would be our to do's other than advertise for it and say, come on out. So there is an entire planning guide. First of all, we have to get the police officers on board to say, yeah, um, which they would be, of course, after this whole Easter thing, I think they're, they, they want to be more in the community and I think it's great. Um, we need to find attractions. We need to find a reason to want people to come there. We need to find a location, possibly shut down a street, parking, see how big we can get it. Maybe we can buy in the bike ride from last year, like the community cycles ride into this, like that, that may be cool. But other than that, there's nothing to do but plan the event and get it out there and ask for money. All right, so what's the first step, Amber, that we need to do? Decide if we want to do it or not. All right, I think I'm going to I think we should do it. Everyone else? Sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I think it does too. Mary. Where? I say shut down Galbraith, or let's be feisty and shut down Hamilton. The corner of Hamilton, <laughs> Hamilton and Galbraith. Oh, that square, that would be great. Let's shut down the corner of Hamilton and Galbraith. Please I want to do that anyway, so I'm, you know, they can reroute around Bising, and that's just my two cents. But you know, the police chief will, he probably won't issue that. <laughs> so we should probably do it at the. Um, Rose's parking lot because that's pretty big obviously see if we can talk to them about opening that up it is really big but it's not very sightly like we want to have like I feel like we need to have like a street festival kind of feel like we want to bring people into the street bring the community together if we had a park big enough to house it that would be cool but I don't know if a parking lot's going to be the right one on this one. Like, I know every year. Now, if you're looking at what Erica was talking about, if that's what you're looking at, that would probably be the most appropriate place. If that's the place where they could have the trailer and the uh, the jumping, because uh, I know what she's talking about, because mm -hmm. we've taken our kids there before in the past as well. Well, didn't uh, didn't the fire department and maybe the police meet like in Kroger Perkins parking lot in the last couple of years for like a, a safety services thing? Maybe that whole corner behind Perkins that's part of uh, Kroger, maybe that area back in there. It's right on Hamilton Avenue. Maybe that's an option. That would be enough parking. I, I guess we just shut down Hamilton and Galbraith. I like and, to Amber, I see what you're trying to do. Every year uh, in Madisonville, they shut down uh, Madison Road and is that Wetzel? For, um, is that where you? Yeah, that's. I mean, I know main, where that area is. Yeah, that main intersection. They do like a back. They it used to be a car like a back to school thing, and they would shut down that whole, like for the whole day eight hours. I don't know if they still shut it down that long. I mean, of course, we can do Galbraith Road again, like uh, the car show. Is it, I, feel uh, like, I feel like that that's the feel that we kind of need. We kind of need like crimmers to be open because normally this happens during the evening. We need like crimmers to be open in the evening. We need SWAD to be open because it's not a Monday. Um, we need Plutos to be open and we really need to like harness in like the opposite of social distancing, I guess, <laughs> for us and just bring our community close and like an area that isn't the typical, like normal, like we, we need to be in the center of, we need to be in the center of it all for this one. Right, so I don't think a parking lot's gonna work. I don't think one of our parks are gonna work. Not even Becker is gonna work. Like it's literally gonna have to be like Galbraith in Hamilton, like we have to draw people in. So you want people to ride past and see it and stop? Yes, and wonder what's going on over there. Like we have to disrupt things. Well, they I won't agree. drive past it. They won't be able to get get around it. They can park and cutting walk. off the center of the city. Right. Mm -hmm. They can park and walk. Yeah. I'll walk from Dallas. 
Yeah, I would agree that it needs to be um, bigger. It needs to be on the street, so it, it causes some disruption. Anything else? So that what, Amber, other than a location, what, what do we need to, who do we need to reach out with to? The police department? Police department, I would say that we need to ask um, Mr. Strand to reach out to the FOP to see if they can cough up some money. I um, think we need to reach out to the DAV. Probably need to get, well, we definitely got to get with Public Works to see if they can block off their time. We're all going to need volunteers. Um, the community tool bank. No, we get those from Blue Ash. We need to reach out to one of the community tool banks probably and get some barricades put up, but the location is going to be the biggest part. Like, once we get that part done, then we can work on everything else because then we got to go to Rumkey. Um, I know from the yard sale, I think like the trash receptacle things are six bucks a piece and a Porta John's like $16 for the night. Maybe we reach out to the church because I know they didn't. They, they canceled their festival, didn't they? Miss Dewald's not on here. They did? Okay. Canceled. Okay, maybe we reach out to them and let them know, and maybe they can partner with us and give us some of their, like, contacts in exchange for helping them fundraise. Like, the goal isn't to make money. The goal is literally just to bring people really, really close and not have the COVID like <laughs> I mean, you know, I know I'm sorry, but it's to like bring the Thank community. name is Verona. I keep telling you. That's right, what Verona. Verona. <laughs> I don't, and what them to have a really good like police presence. Like, so when they came down my street, like I didn't know who was in the Easter Bunny costume until I was, you know, six and a half feet away from them. They're like, hey, Amber, it's Officer Kilgore. And I was like, what's up? Like, I just think it was great and it built a lot of trust like seeing the Easter Bunny with the cops here and I think that we need to keep building it. All right. Um, so I can reach out to Shran and try to build a consensus of maybe he has some ideas of where we want to put it. Um, does anyone want to take the lead on this? No one wants to raise their well, hand. It's, gonna, it's actually going to come to administration anyway. So yeah. I'll, I'll just, you know, talk to them about it and see what, All we, right. can, see what we can do. All right. Thanks, Ron. You're the best, Ron. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> Mr. Chair, I actually yeah. have a logistical question. Sure. So do we have to leave this meeting in order to go to the next meeting? How does that work? No, I don't believe so. I think we just, I thought we all decided that we would use the same link to go into the next one, right? Is that? But I thought it was supposed to, this would stop, close, and then they would, you know, then they would open an, another meeting. Mary Jo, that's, that's a you question. Or Josh. Hey, Josh. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm here. Um, so what I've been told to do, and this is what I was told you guys had agreed on, was we would stay under the same link. I'll bring up the same full screen as we did before. We'll get our new members in. Uh, any members that need to leave can leave. And um, then once you guys are ready, same thing. As soon as the full screen comes down, you're good to go on the next one. If that all makes sense. Uh, sounds good. Is there anything else before we end? I think we're... Can I? Yeah. No, but I know, guys, I know we're already late, but can I take like three minutes? I mean, you're the chair of the next one. So. Thank you. Mr. Josh, can you give me like three minutes? Absolutely. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.
guys. Thank you for being patient with me. Amber, are you ready for me to uh, start this next portion? Yeah, ma'am. All right, I'll uh, bring this full screen down. Once I do, you guys are ready to go. Hey guys, again, thanks for being patient with me and my little one. So, um, all of the finance members are here. Do we want to do a roll call or do we just want to do like a thumbs up? Christian, Mary Jo, Erica, cool. Okay. So you guys have the agenda in front of you, I hope. Does everybody have it or no? You also have minutes from February and March. I know I overwhelmed everyone, I'm sorry. Adam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I, I know I did get a lot of, um, downloads is is the agenda a part of one of those downloads it should be let me just make sure it should be i'm sorry that's okay i should have eric i should have like fifth, it's like the fifth one in okay yeah i did them out of order and that's because i was dragging and dropping as i was going like Okay. Okay, here we go. Is everybody cool to move along with the agenda? Yeah. And since I got the minutes to you guys roughly right at five o'clock today, do you wanna, you have them? Do you wanna wait until next meeting to adopt this set, next set, and that set, or? I can tell you, I did not have time to read any of them. I don't know if anybody else did. I didn't, I, um, oh, crummy. I didn't, um, I, I had, I guess at the time that I looked earlier, um, the only one that I saw was for um, uh, community development. So I just haven't had an opportunity to look at them yet. Yeah. So let's hold off. If you guys are cool with it, let's hold off on the minutes until our next meeting. But you do have a copy of them. Will you guys re read over them beforehand? Uh, and again, it's my bad. Um, so first on the agenda, we have the Dallas Avenue house, which coincides with the Dallas Avenue resolution. Long story short, it's basically asking and giving permission to Mr. Mosby to reach out to a professional in the real estate realm to get us a fair listing price for the house or a fair selling price for the house and the property. Currently, we're just sitting on the Dallas Avenue house and we have no plans for it. So we either need to sell it or do something. So this is just him getting in basically an appraisal or yep. uh, not an appraisal, but a estimate, I guess. 
Yep, what's fair? Amber? Yes, sir? Just my two cents. I'm, and I've mentioned this before, I'm just not a fan of pieces of legislation for something like this. It was kind of thing Mr. Hedger put out once before. Uh, to me, it would just make more sense that we did uh, a motion and approval from council, uh, even if, if we wanted to put it in writing uh, to make it a little more uh, specific or something other than just being in the minutes. But that's the only thing. I just think that we're adding a layer of bureaucracy with, through legislation when it could simply be a motion. We definitely need to do something with the property. That's, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. That's Mr. O'Shea, for once I agree with you, I am cool with doing a simple motion <laughs> for one time. <laughs> that, just kidding, but I would be totally cool with just doing a simple motion. It's just something that we spoke about in our finance committee last time. And I think that we need to start doing something with it. Yeah, I would think if anything, if the motion obviously could be stated on the floor, but it could also be in writing and it could be handed in that way. But even okay. then, I think that's unnecessary. But I know sometimes something like this, people may feel more warm and fuzzy to have something in writing. So, Mr. Hedger and um, finance committee members, would you guys be cool if we drafted like a letter to Mr. Mosby and signed it as chair and vice chair asking him to? Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. And then we would still do the simple motion on the floor in our next council meeting, but it would just be like chair and vice chair or all a finance committee. I just don't want to drive to y'all's houses and have y'all sign it like. Can we sign it electronically? I don't know. Does Google offer that? PDF does. Okay. Do you have a scanner? You can sign it and scan it. <clears throat> Need a scanner. Okay. Okay, cool. So we're cool with that, yeah? Um, Madam Chair, I'm Actually, it might be simpler than that. Um, honestly, if we just simply transferred the deed over to CIC, CIC could then take it, sell it, obviously, without going through the bureaucracy, as Mr. O'Shea said, and then they could transfer the proceeds back to us. Mr. Mosby, I suggested that once before, but um, some of my peers would prefer that we have that council has a fair, basic selling price for this before it's transferred to the CIC. Well, that, I mean, that's kind of the whole point for transferring it to the CIC because they would, and we actually have a realtor, as you know, that's on the that's on the uh, committee, that you know, the leadership committee there, um, who could probably, you know, with them they could. They, they would be able to set a fair selling price and they would actually be able to do it without some of the constraints that we as a municipality would have for that. So in theory, that's great, but that doesn't pan out. And I'll, I can tell you two examples that I'm aware of and there's probably more. So would it make the committee members feel better if we went ahead, drafted a letter, had Mr. Mosby reach out before we transferred any deeds, we just got an idea of what it was worth. Uh, my question would be, what is that obligation to the CIC then? Let's say we find out it's worth $10,000. Mm -hmm. or we find out it's worth a hundred thousand dollars what how does that how does that information so the what that would, what in the that transfer <laughs> so i forget the name of it exactly but we've dealt with it once before as a city between the school and the school board property and the where we are now the city center and all of that 
it would basically be if, for example, we got a fair selling price of it for $45,000, we would, when we deeded it over to the CIC, it would say, you can sell this for a minimum of blah, blah, blah. Like, it could be part of the deed, I'm pretty sure. It cannot be sold less than $5,000. Okay. I'm pretty sure, but I'm not a lawyer, so. Right now you're playing one on TV. The dun dun flaw in order. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I mean, we're paying property taxes on it. We're paying a water hookup on it. Like, is there another use that we could use it for other than selling it? I know there was talks before I was on council of it becoming a, um, like a secondary police post. Substation. Substation, there we go, like. Micro dog park. No, there's a structure there, sir, but maybe. <laughs> right I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, Amber, I certainly agree with you because this has actually been, that, that was an issue when I was on council. Um, so it still hasn't been, so it still hasn't been resolved as of yet. But the whole purpose of the CIC obviously is to act as an agent for the city. Um, so sure, you know, as Madam Chair had said, conceivably you could, you could say, you know, you want that you could write in an agreement that you want the CIC to sell it for no less than X number of thousands of dollars. That could happen. Um, but I do think that with the CIC, what we have is the ability to allow them to negotiate without having to do things, quote unquote, in public. Obviously, everything that we do um, would have to be done in public. So they could, you know, negotiate deals or negotiate prices. Um, without the, you know, without that requirement. Um, so right. that's why I suggested that. So, yes, sir. Um, I think, I think what it is, is I think that, and I'm not trying to be hateful, but everybody, like, we know that the CIC can do that. Of course, I know the CIC can do that, but I think that there's been a level of distrust between the CIC and the council for quite some time. And I think that this would be a really good way to kind of bring that bond back together and build that trust is to show that, hey, this is what the house is worth based off of this realtor, professional, whomever. And then we work from there because I think that until the council and the CIC works not cohesively in that, like as far as anything like that goes, just as far as they can trust each other, then we'll get a lot further with both the council and the CIC. But until then, we're just, we're not. So I think if Mr. Mosby, if you go out and you get a fair estimate on it and the, C, the council can dictate what kind of deed that they would like to have on it and what kind of clauses they would like to have in there and the CIC can follow through because of course the CIC can, then it would build more of a level of trust there. Okay. So on the Dallas Avenue house, we're gonna scratch this resolution. I will email all the finance a letter the finance committee a letter on letterhead asking Mr. Mosby to reach out to a real estate professional and then we will go from there with the Dallas Avenue house, yeah? Cool. So next we have OWPC legislation. So basically this is our skip grants and our skip loans. 
it is an annual piece of legislation that comes through finance. It's typically due in June or July um, that says we want to participate in the state capital improvements program. If there's no discussion on this, I would move it to our next council meeting. I'm assuming this is all the same verbiage like from last year, it's just been updated. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So next one is our ODOT salt contract. Also one that we do annually. Um, this is to participate in the buying of a bulk amount of salt. I would question, do we need salt? I know that we have placed an order for 100 tons of salt and we have to purchase 90% of that, which would be 90 tons of salt. So I'm going to guess that probably yes, as Marty has not steered us wrong in salt buying so far. But again, that's an assumption. Oh, for 2020 or? No. So we're, we're, when we get the salt contract, what we're doing is we're, we're purchasing at a fixed price for in essence, a future, for a future date. Um, Ms. Zorb, of course, was asking about what we use this year. We didn't use a lot this year because we just didn't have that much snow. I don't know if any of you had seen, but I was watching the uh, news and the weather. The forecaster was saying how, um, this is a couple of weeks ago that normally at this time of year, we would have had 20 inches of snow and we only had eight for this year. So it was a foot below. However, we can't predict what's going to happen next year. So I think in the prior year, we had used between 250 and 270 tons of salt. So we aren't purchasing nearly as much um, because obviously we still have some, you know, available. But um, but I have talked to, as Miss Bailey said, I did talk to uh, Marty about it, and uh, we agreed that 100 tons would be a, a reasonable amount for uh, for us to purchase this year. So what happened to the leftover salt? Is is that just still is that still there? For right, us yeah, right. We we have some in in our storage in our in our container. If there's not any more discussion, I'm gonna move this one out as well. Sorry, it's getting dark. All right, next we have everyone's favorite, the fire equipment fund. So backstory, I thought that we had actually passed this in 2017, but appar apparently it did not make it through the motions. So what I have sent to everyone today is a, a draft that has been reviewed by the law directors at law director at this point and um, to protect the funds for the fire equipment fund for just very specified uses. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. In the in the what I'm looking at, it says the red, the amendments were not reviewed. So you're saying that the amendments were reviewed yes, by the law director. Yes, ma'am. I was slacking and did not change that today, but yes, ma'am, they were. Okay. So I think this was kind of brought up the last time we were 
talking about the budget. And my question is, what did this look like before those edits were made? All of the black. So you just added words, you didn't change any previous words? No, ma'am, and if I did, okay, so it- Because that second whereas wouldn't make sense without the red. Uh, so some okay. words had to be changed. I did not change any of them at all. Hold on one second. I did not change any of them, I can tell you. So everything in black would have been the original resolution that, um, no, fire equipment fund. Okay, I'm sorry, the original ordinance. The red would have been, this would have been past proposed voters. Okay, so you're at, where are you? The city of North College Hills Fire Department proposed to voters a property tax levy, which was subsequently passed by the voters. And so all of the red is new department. Maybe, okay. Do you see my point? If you take the red out, that doesn't make sense. So there had to be something different there. Okay. See what I, I, yes, ma'am, I can tell you, hold on. I didn't change that. Or it wasn't caught the first time around. But we'll see. Other than that, I didn't delete anything at all. I only added reasons that the money could be expended for. And Amber, you're, this, this was the ordinance that uh, Mr. Wallard originally put together, but never made it through, correct? Yes, sir. So, so really, Mary Jo, I guess to us, this is really just a new ordinance, right? Whatever it said before, in a sense, doesn't really matter. It's a new ordinance that we want to consider to put restrictions on the fire equipment fund. And, and what's spelled out here are those restrictions. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, you said this was approved by the law director. He didn't have any corrections to this. There, there's just a, a couple of places that- Oh, he told me this. He told me that there were typos and misspellings, but I didn't go back through it for that because you guys know that I'm horrible at grammar. So, but yes, <laughs> there are a couple of misspellings that I need to go back through. But as far as content goes, the content is correct. Ms. Bailey, does this replace the piece of legislation that was passed? Um, gosh, I don't remember the year that Ms. Mason came up with. Do you know? No, Madam Mayor. Yes, ma'am. I don't even know what piece of legislation that could be. It was one similar to this one that I can't see. I know I've read it a thousand times, but I guess it wouldn't do any good if I don't know the ordinance number because I never could find it. I just was told that there was one that Mayor Mason had and council passed it some years ago that all of the funding that was uh, came in, it only went towards the fire equipment fund. And so when I saw so, this, I'm so, thinking maybe you revise it. So, because so I maybe, maybe Maureen pinned the one from 2007. Uh -huh. Maybe she pinned that one. Did, so, it serve, did it serve the same purpose as this one? No. Okay. So basically what I have understood throughout this whole process is the fire equipment fund has been depleted and been used to offset deficits in our general fund for a long, long time. Meanwhile, as a couple of us know, we have grasped at every straw that we could find and listened to every proposal and went through 
an insane amount of money to try to find a new solution for the fire department to have funding to staff people. However, we keep taking money from the fire equipment fund, which <laughs> is my understanding, and Ms. O Mr. O'Shea can probably tell me differently if I'm wrong. The fire equipment fund is funded through EMS billings. So basically, the more billings they do, the more runs they do, the more work that they put in to collect, that's what's funding this account. And instead of them having access to it for their wants or needs or what have you, we pull from it to replenish our general fund. Am I wrong? Which, which there was a, there was legislation that was supposed to prohibit us from doing that and it was still being done. It got lost. That's the one from 2017 that is, it's a ghost. Well, the fact that it's a ghost, I mean, that doesn't take away from the fact that if it wasn't supposed to happen, then it still happened. If we passed it at some point. But there's no the, record that it was. We ever were saying, didn't pass it. I found, I'm sorry to, to jump in. Um, Please do. I, I found old emails from um, Mr. Waller to, at the time, the clerk of Linda Stagman and Apparently it went for one reading and then apparently Mr. Waller talked to the law director and there was some discussion going on there and Ms. Stagman put it on the agenda for a second reading. Mr. Waller sent Ms. Stagman an email and said, please remove it from the agenda for the second reading as we figure this out. And then for lack of a better term, all hell broke loose with the whole errata. Um, Ventures. Okay, the, but I said, I didn't, I said prior it, to them. Right. Prior to them, 2007. Right. None of those people were there in 2007. No, I, I, I have no knowledge of 2007. That's um, what I was referring to. Oh, Miss, Madam Mayor. Yes. So in 2007, Hold on one second. This one should be safe. Okay, so this should be. Okay, so I'm pretty sure the one from 2007 says all funds under section two, all funds collected present to this section shall be used to offset the expenses of collection of said funds in the balance shall be credited to the fire department fund the fund should solely be for fire department needs is the way I'm remembering it, but not seeing it, so. Well, Madam Mayor and Madam, Ch Madam Chair, um, a couple of things. Number one, the fire equipment fund is a very old fund, of course. It was prior, there was at one point it was called the, I believe it was the ambulance fund. It, it got changed, but the whole purpose of the fund was for us to purchase major equipment such as a fire truck and you know major equipment for the fire department. Uh, there was a concern, and I believe that prior to uh, Ms. Hall becoming the finance manager, uh, Mr. Cropper had brought this up to council, and it was uh, how not so much how the how the money in there is used, but rather how money is going into it. And I think there was a concern that he had, and I would support this is that uh, it, you'd, it, would, it would not be good to take that money, the, the, the proceeds that are coming you know, from our, um, from our um, ambulance services and put that directly into uh, the fund. Uh, what, what I believe that Mr. Cropper was proposing at the time was that that money go into the general fund. Money then could be used to be transferred into the fire equipment fund. And then yes, that money would be preserved strictly for use of purchasing major fire equipment, which that can that still can and should be done. Um, but the but I think part of the concern was how was the money getting in there and whether or not that money should go directly into that fund or should it go into the general fund? So basically, we would collect the money 
it would go into the general fund, be transferred into the fire equipment fund, which is cool because that creates a paper trail. The question is though, is do we want to restrict the funds or the reasons that the fire equipment fund can be used? I, and I would say yes to that. That would be, a, a, again, that was the original purpose of creating the fund was to reserve those funds for, you know, mate for a major purchase in the fire department. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, and I do understand that in the past um, that monies had been transferred out, as you mentioned, uh, Madam Chair, for uses other than uh, the purchase of major fire equipment. Madam Chair, <clears throat> I, guess, I, I guess my issue is still the fact that this piece of legislation is there. So if we're going to reverse how this legislation does it, does your piece of legislation need to say now it goes into the general fund first instead of going into the fire equipment fund first? Because of 2007, it says go into the fire equipment fund and use for that purpose. And now you want it to just go into the general fund and then we remove it from the general fund. We would have to. Um... I missed something. Where does it say this is going into the general fund? Something no, else she just, so what Mr. Something she stated. No, so what, I guess what, okay, so it's not, it, I, Mr. Mosby, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm actually understanding this. So basically, the money that is collected based off of the billings to the cent would be collected through the general fund, but the money after that would be transferred to the fire equipment fund, dollar right. for dollar. So those would match, which would clean up the collections right on, it would clean up the collections process on the fire equipment fund and the EMS billings. The amount of money would still be the same. The accounting process would be a little bit different. So it wouldn't reverse any of that. It's do we want to restrict these funds to fire equipment, training, capital outlay? The rest of it would still be seamless. So I kind of don't want to get hung up on that, which is really selfish. I'm sorry. But do we want to restrict these funds? Well, I, did, I was under the impression uh, when it was originally done that it wasn't even for, you mentioned a couple of things. One of them that you mentioned was training. Um, it was supposed to be for, you know, strictly the purchase of major uh, equipment. And yeah. I think that to your point, that's that that may have been part of the, the problem of what happened. Mr. Spells um, did give us a, sm a short briefing when Ms. Hall came in to, to kind of give an overview of that. And I actually did point out, uh, Ms. Bailey, some of the things that you had mentioned that even though there was an increase uh, due to the fire levy, that uh, what happened was a lot of that was offset by the decrease A in the amount of funding that was being uh, dedicated to the fire department from the general fund. And then as you said, the depletion of the uh, fire equipment fund. So going down to the, the nuts and bolts of this, I, I don't know that I agree to the um, in section two in the red part where it says the capital improvement projects. And I, I believe there's probably a word missing there because it says to the in regards to the fire station. And I don't, I don't know that I'm still a believer that the building should should not depend on the departments. And that goes for the police department too. It's not like public works pays for their building improvements out of their budget and finance doesn't pay for building improvements out of their budget. So why do the police and fire? And I sure don't think it should have to come out of this fund. That's well, my quite frankly, we can't take it from the general fund because we're already strapped there. They keep putting off capital improvements to their building because their levy doesn't make enough money to do so. Neither does their general fund contribution because you know we cut it year by year. Honestly, we do because we're strapped. But to so, me, this that's the biggest money draw out of this. And there's never that's where this fund is going to get depleted again. From however, 
project. However, though, that's up to the fire chief, I guess. You see what I'm saying? Like they keep what putting budget? off like key to submit no, their budget. It would be on the finance director. It would be on the city administrator. It'd be on whoever controls the budget. It wouldn't necessarily be on the fire chief. I but, disagree with that. Okay. I'm sorry, I stand corrected. However, though, it they they keep putting off improvements to their buildings because the money is never there. And if we're gonna restrict the funds, should we not open it up to the fire department capital improvements or do you just leave that out completely and then they keep, they, they don't get what they need. They don't get a roof. They don't get an air conditioning. They don't get mold taken out. Like they keep putting that off because they don't have the money to do so. I believe so. capital outlay is still part of their, their budget. It, it doesn't have to come out of the fire equipment fund is all I'm trying to say. It's still in their portion of the budget. It, so it is, but There's no it, money every in. year, every year it is until the end of the year when it doesn't happen because they can't afford it. I hear you. So I'm just trying to give them, if we're going to restrict it, let's at least give them the leeway to have a little bit of a nest egg here, like a little bit of escrow basically to fix up what they need to fix up as far as their building goes. I just feel like the fire department would not have a say so in that. And that's where, that's where the money would go. That's my gut feeling. I wonder if we could maybe, what if I ask, if we could subsection that one to have like an extra definition that says by request of the fire chief only or some kind of legal language, I don't know. For building capital. Amber, your house got really dark. I know, I'm, I'm, I know. <laughs> I'm gonna move, but then I have to stop the video to move to somewhere that has light. Like I have no natural light here, so. Okay. Okay. I'm still here. I'm just moving. You have to turn your lights on. That's what I had to do. <laughs> but then my neighbors can see in. Hold on. Am I the only one that has an issue with the capital improvement projects? Because I guess if I'm the only one, then it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, Ms. Zorb, to be quite honest with you, I don't know whether I have an issue with it or not because I just didn't get this information in time enough to really read it and process it. So I'm just, you know, I I would like a fair opportunity to to um to to look at it and understand what I'm talking about. Sure. Um, so I can't answer that. I don't know whether I have a problem with it or not. All right. Yeah, I, I do have some concerns with the capital improvement coming out of there. I understand that this gives an opportunity for the city to have access to some funds for capital improvement. So it's kind of a spin, right? It gives opportunity to get access to that fund but on the reverse, it also provides an opportunity for that fund to be depleted strictly for that purpose and the main purpose of the fund not have any money to be served. So I, I, I can see, that I would say at this point, based on your question, Mary Jo, I would, I would not support the inclusion of capital improvements on there. I would agree that that all departments, all city building structures, et cetera, would come from the general fund. But. I mean, I don't disagree with um, either of your points. The only issue is, is there is no budget money in the general fund to offer capital improvements. So that is a concern. Um, and the longer you hold things off, the more costly they become if we don't have the money in there to fix it. And when the, you know, fund you see for the fire equipment is going up by $60,000 a year, however great that is for to buy equipment, but if we can't put a roof over the 
the fire department to house the equipment, how effective overall is that? That's just my general thinking is I get that I would like to see a capital improvement project. I don't think it should come out of a special fund, but what do we do when we do need to make those choices? Where does the money come from? Um, Madam Chair. I don't know that she's back yet. Yeah, I don't think she's back. Um, what I was gonna say is as a part of public safety, my, um, my plan was to um, try to put something on the ballot um, for the fire department um, this year, since the other, I guess the, the joint, that joint thing didn't pass. So my goal was to try to put something together I um, obviously don't have that information ready for today, but I was, you know, my goal was to have it ready for a public safety meeting in a couple of weeks. So um, I'm hoping that I'll have that done and ready to go. And maybe, you know, that that'll help with some of this discussion. I just don't, um, again, I, I just don't know enough about this right now to, to be able to Yeah, I, um, Ms. Underwood, I actually, I, I definitely empath empathize with you in this in this case. I think, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a very wise saying, if you don't know the purpose of a thing, you'll abuse it. And so if we don't know the purpose of the fire equipment fund, it'll be abused. And uh, I do think that it ought to be a, a fund, which was, if it's going to be done, um, that it was, it was a fund that was in, initially created to, for the purpose of accumulating funds in order to make uh, major purchases for fire equipment. We all know that, you know, basically the two biggest services that we have, that we provide for the city are police and fire. Um, and so, you know, they make up well over 60% of our, of our budget. And if you then factor in the uh, restricted funds through the levies, you know, it's over 80% of our budget. Mr. So, Murphy? Yes. So the original piece of legislation does not say for the purpose of making purchases, equipment, liens, leases for major equipment for the fire department. It actually just says for the fire department. And that's where the transfer was coming out of. So then in 2017, Mr. Waller proposed the ghost piece, as I call it now, that this fund could only be used for repairs, maintenance, leases, and purchasing major equipment. So right, right now, it's really loosely written that basically all of this money can be transferred out for salaries, dispatch fees, all of the above, but in its essence, it's called a fire equipment fund. Right, but I'm, I'm actually talking about well before that. This, this is a fund that was established long time ago, over 30 years ago. Right. And, and at the time it was an ambulance fund and that was really the purpose for it and originally. And then it did, you are correct. It got, uh, it got broadened uh, basically to provide for uh, other major purchases such as, you know, a fire truck, a ladder. Um, so, I, and all I'm saying is, you know, council obviously has to decide. Uh, again, I'm, I, I would certainly be in agreement with having a fund that would be restricted to the use of, of making major purchases uh, for the fire department. Unfortunately, we have Ms. Hall on as well. So, you know, if that is a recommendation that comes out of the finance committee, that would be fine. And, and I do think that it should not be used to, to cover, as you pointed out, you know, other uh, expenses such as salaries and, you know, some of the other things, uh, training, that kind of thing. So, so do we want to sleep on this one until our next meeting? Um, personally, I would like to, I, I just need to understand kind of what we're dealing with um, so that I can effectively um, have input on this. Everyone else cool to sleep on it till our next meeting? Cool. 
Okay, so next one. Um, we can probably run through these maybe a little quick, maybe not, but so bag tax. I know I brought this up a while ago. This is literally disposable bag tax for all of those plastic bags that everyone sees everywhere. Um, Mr. Hedger was working on a piece and we kind of combined the two. Basically 10 cents a bag in North College Hill, five cents goes to, is it five and five or seven and three? Anyhow, a portion of the proceeds from said tax goes to the retailer. The other portion comes to us. There is no minimum square footage set on this one right now. Um, Mr. Hedger did bring that up because of course he doesn't want to penalize the small businesses. Um, however, I feel like they're just going to pass it on to the customer anyways. <laughs> and so well, Madam Andrew. Chair, are you talking about 10 cents per bag or 10 cents per transaction? 10 cents per bag. I know that Kroger's was talking about completely doing away with their plastic bags in the next few years. I don't know what their time table is for that, but I know no. that they are moving away from plastic bags totally. Now, just... this is not, this is not, this isn't, it's kind of like a little source of revenue, but this is not supposed to offset our revenue needs by any means. It's literally to kind of offset the cost of sending people to clean out our storm drains and to have the street sweeper go around. If we're gonna, like, it's not meant for a source of revenue as in like to take the tax from the bag. It's kind of just to start cleaning up the bags that are already everywhere. Amber, um, so I, I did reach out to Kroger to try to um, determine on how many bags they use just at the local our location. And from what information they gave me, they go through millions and millions of bags per year, just at our local Kroger, which I is just astonishing. Um, so for me, I wanted to see uh, a restriction on who get who is this applied to, and that's why I liked a minimum square footage requirement. So it doesn't hurt the mom and pop shops that you know do have bags or shoppers come in because. This sometimes can be kind of burdensome, burdensome to the you know, retailer to implement and somehow keep track of. So that was kind of my thought. A lot of the larger retailers, they already operate in cities and states that already have taxes, restrictions placed on this, and they have ways to go ahead and implement it already into cities that you know pass this. Um, so that was my thought behind it. You know, looking at Walgreens, Dollar General, Family Dollar Store, um, Kroger, obviously, they all operate in cities that have similar legislation passed. Um, the only, my only concern about this, Madam Chair, Mr. Hedger, is um, if you do a Google map search for the Nor North College Hill Kroger and the Finneytown Kroger, they are equidistant from my house. And if I know that I'm paying an extra 10 cents to my grocery bill per bag, if I go to North College Hill Kroger versus the same distance to Finneytown Kroger, I'm just going to go to Finneytown Kroger. So with that being said, though, if you knew that you were paying 10 cents per bag in taxes, but five cents of that was going back to clean up all of the litter and to plant stuff and to make the city look awesome, the city that you live in. Would you not spare the 10 cents? 10 cents per bag? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, the, but depending on who does my bagging, I might have 30 bags. Because they double bag everything. Right. They double bag. And I mean, I might have 30 Ooh. bags for just a few little groceries i mean is it I mean, is it possible that that i don't know that you have, it just seems to me like you're, you're talking about adding anywhere from three to five dollars to my grocery bill every time i go to the grocery store and that's you know if you're on a budget that that is a lot you know i'm i mean i'm not rolling like that so i'm not gonna lie to you you know i'm not rolling like that where i can just 
throw out an extra five dollars every the time. other the other option is erica this doesn't tax people if you use a paper bag so you still have the option to use a paper bag for free and you still have the option to bring a reusable bag and i was somewhat behind the idea of also help using these funds to help purchase reusable ba bags and give them out to people um i did reach out to a couple other cities that have done this and they've all they all use partial funds to actually give bags out to the to actual citizens where they would send them a physical bag and say because of the tax pass here's an actual bag from north college hill that was an option that they did so there there are and you know definitely those concerns and that's why you know since paper is recyclable and it decomposes a lot better than a plastic bag that's why that's still allowed and i and um also is is there some way we can enforce because a lot of times you know going down hamilton avenue there are people who are driving through our city throwing trash out the window i mean i don't know how we can what we can do about that but yeah, i think that would be more of an administration i have asked that question multiple times and the only way that we can do it is is literally if people take a video of them throwing it out so that way the police can see it and have evidence of them doing so like yeah you can say that hey that silver ultima with z z z z z z z just threw out a bunch of garbage but they don't really have a leg to stand on and litter here is a problem yeah. plastic bags are a problem like it's just and we don't even have to do 10 cents if um we could do lower than 10 cents. I mean, it's just, we could do two cents. Yeah, I mean, my thing is, is the whole point to motivate people to move towards another bag, another use other than a plastic bag. I think if you go lower, it's not gonna motivate people. Cause I think it, like to Erica's point, I think two to $3 might motivate someone to say, well, I can just use a paper bag or I have my own bag, make sure I'll remember to bring it in next time. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here and bring us back to our fire equipment fund. How are we capturing that money and making sure that we can use it to use that specific tax money so, to buy those reusable yeah. bags and send them to citizens? So the reusable bags, I don't, I, I know it's not in there. I know that the restricted uses for us are in here and the yeah, but I think in mine, I put it in the community environmental, I don't remember, I don't have it in front of me. It was, because we have a fund that we don't even use. And I thought it kind of meets the, Hold the on that title one. of it. I don't remember what it was though. Mary Jo, are you asking who collects the money? Like what's the process for that? Or where does the money go? I'm asking you, is there a way that that money is tracked? I heard, I heard Christian say something about um, purchasing reusable bags and giving them to citizens. And I heard you say something about using that, the tax money collected to pay people to clean up and to clean out storm sewers and stuff like that. So I'm asking, what is the tracking that is in place similar to the fire equipment fund that that captures that money and make sure it make sure it goes to those specific things and not just sit in the general fund so under yeah, Amber, do you have the it in the budget i don't remember it was in mine that i sent you i don't remember it, your line item is there um which probably needs to be put into this one so under Disposable, disposable bag fee requirements under definition. Sorry, guys. I did catch a typo on myself, though. So um, for each disposable bag provided to a customer, well, you guys can read 10 cents, six cents would be remitted to the city with four cents to use as implementation and education for the business establishment, blah, blah, blah. But if you go... Is it, uh, there is an exemption. Mary Jo, it is spelled out in here how the money. Can you tell me where it is? Um, yeah, it'll give me just a second, sorry. 
Now the disposable, the reusable back part is not in here, but could be added in here as well as the square footage. It just hasn't been done yet. If I understood uh, Mary Jo's question and, and Mary Jo, you can correct me, but I think you were asking basically how it would be captured and then how it would be accounted for in our budget. Exactly. Okay. So exactly. what would have to happen of course, is that we would work then with Rita and there would be a, uh, you know, they, they would account for a special, basically it becomes a special revenue uh, from those particular businesses or establishments. So when they filed, they would file with Rita. Rita would then take that money once they collected, it would be collected into our general fund. And actually, um, I think later on, uh, Ms. Hall, might be able to expound on this as well. Um, but then obviously we would have to take it and put it into you know, our special fund, whatever that fund would be that the council would say, okay, you know, we want this money to go into this particular fund. If it's in, I think I heard Mr. Hedger talk about an environmental fund. If that is something that you know, council wanted to do, then it would be appropriated there or you know, another, another fund. So, yeah, go, excuse me. so it comes in and then we would obviously have to you know, put it into that. Uh, yeah, I guess I would anticipate it being within this document so that it's all in one centralized location. Oh, you would you would prefer to see it. Sorry, and I know it's dark again. You would prefer to see it that um, the whole collection process with Rita, like how businesses already file taxes is within the city. You would like to see that spelled out in here. I don't know that I need the Rita part, but if you wanted to go to a certain line item, then it should go to that line item. Okay, cool. Good. Did you, uh, Amber, Amber in, in your legislation, did you put in here how the collection process works? I don't know, because I know in mine I had it more detailed, or I guess I don't know detailed on that portion. I did, yes. Um, I left out the part about Rita and the bag tax is really, the uses are really general. Sorry, that's under section one. And that is for um, offsetting the cost associating with disposable bags to pay yeah. mitigation, that part. Yeah, that part. Do you really have an enforcement section? I'm sorry, I haven't read your schooling. I do. All right. And then like an auditing section as well? Uh, yes, sir. I'm pretty sure. Right. So. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I would submit that we just haven't had enough time to um, review this before we send this to the council floor and can we just um, oh sure yeah yeah this is the first time you guys are seeing it so it's kind of just like an introduction to say hey here it is like pick it apart and then maybe we can uh kind of table it for until the next meeting to give everybody an opportunity to read it very carefully and and even maybe suggest um if, if there's any suggestions for changes or edits or whatever that is you know we can send those to you for sure yes. okay so hamilton county planning grant the mini grant um i think this would be a good time to apply for a grant um for, I mean, given the fact that we just talked about our comprehensive plan, I mean, let's throw that out there. Like, it's not up to us for this to decide. Um, but as far as sharing our mission and our vision for the city, if we want to apply to this, I think it would be a good idea to give Mr. Mosby what we would like to apply for it for. Um, we could apply for it for a parks and recreation um, plan a strategic plan based on the beauty area in North College Hill, sorry, or conditional use permits, business districts, uh, bars. If you go online and you'd like to see what other communities have submitted for, I mean, it's all across the board. Do we have any idea, wishes, like, planner's gonna plan. Um, 
Madam Chair, who, who actually writes this grant? So this, um, well, right now it would be up to administration to write the grant. I just think that it's important for us to give feedback based on it. Um, of course, they get to do whatever they want to, but I think one part of all of us working together is us definitely coming in, in line. Like, I know that we wanna see a plan for parks and recreation. I know that we need to update our comprehensive plan. We probably need to go through and look at our business densities and go through that, but what it, or residential versus commercial or industrial even for that matter. So I think that is being a cohesive area of council, we should ask or say, this is what we would like to steer toward versus steering toward this. Well, we just talked about a lot of different ideas in the committee meeting before this. Can we use any of this for a dog park or a Frisbee golf park or? This is just for a plan. So this uh, grant money, this time is just for a plan centered around what? And a plan around the beauty district. Okay. I mean, if we're, if we're going forward with that, why not use somebody else's money to do it? I like that. No, I like it. I mean, Mr. Mosby, did you guys, or Miss, sorry, Madam Mayor, or Mr. Mosby, did you guys have any ideas of writing for this or like, are we stepping on your toes, I guess? Well, <laughs> I, uh, I think I better ref uh, defer to the mayor on this. Can you repeat your question? I was looking up something on the internet, I'm sorry. You're good. Um, so we know that we can't write for the grant, mm -hmm. um, but are we stepping on toes if we ask that we write that the grant be um, written for planning and research of a beauty district for North College Hill? I don't think you're stepping on toes, um, but in all fairness, we wanna make sure that it covers everything that both parties are interested in, okay. or all parties. Cool. I have a question for administration. Uh, Ron or Tracy, I know that we appropriated money for grant writing. Um, has there been any movement on that at all? Um, actually, no, not, a, not as of yet. All right, thank you. Cool. So salary ordinance, I don't have anything yet, but I'm waiting. Uh, rental registration. So for this one, what Christian and I have been discussing is, is raising the fee, but taking half of the new proceeds and starting a homeowners, home buyers down payment grant assistance program in North College Hill. So the fee currently is $50 per property to register that you have a rental property in North College Hill, whether it be residential or commercial based on the parameters. We're looking at $150 per property, um, increasing the fines for those who just don't register and then taking half of the proceeds from that and starting a down pay down payment assistant grant for home buyers in North College Hill. Not first time home buyers, just home buyers in North College Hill. Yeah. That's... Sounds like a great idea. So the funds and the fees in raising this would not happen this year. Um, of course, it would be effective January 1 of next year, which would give us plenty of time to alert everyone. Um, but then on a general fund side of this, we're going to see, what was it, a 25% increase, Christian? Yeah. You're the numbers person. Yeah, it was about a 25% increase to our current revenue just for the general fund. And that gives us um, 
I think it was around 45,000 or so to help for new home buyers. Um, and I think it gives us plenty of time to actually model that program out and reach out to other municipalities that have a similar programs um, so that we can get a, a running program up to actually help you know, many families, you know, buy a house in North College Hill. So the only thing that we've talked about outside of that is we've talked about an up to match amount and um, has to be a primary place of residency for at least five years. So of course, all of that is subject to change in any legislation or board or whatever comes out of this, but that's the only thing that we've talked about that you will live here and we will match you and uh, we're not doing like income barriers or any of that but somebody's going to have to fill those applications but I think it's a well we think it's a small step into bringing homeowners in and then converting renters into right. homeowners and so you mean you know I talked with my my mom some and she's in mortgage she's been in mortgage for about 25 years programs like these you know are extremely beneficial to get people to move in and they help people quickly get a house um, and usually you know most of the time the funds become available like by March or so it's like they have an open window and they're gone by April May usually so um, it really does help get people in to a city um, and it helps you know people find out especially people who already currently live in North College Hill and know about this, you know, they can take advantage of it if they just need to help get that first initial down payment or aren't quite there, but just need a little bit of a, you know, push up. So, and, and, then, and then on top of that, you add in our CRA and our, well, our CRA, because the whole city is a community reinvestment area and they can be reimbursed for any improvements that they do over like a 10 year abatement. So I think it's an aggressive move it's going to piss a lot of landlords off, but I mean, it's aggressive, man. Like, a lot. So you're basically saying that you're looking at tripling the fees that yeah. they're paying right now. Absolutely. If they can, if they can walk into my street and yeah. buy five houses in cash, they can pay these rates. Yes, they can. I agree with that. And Christian is a land, not a landlord. Christian is a rental property owner in the city of North College Hill. I'm okay paying with paying it. I mean, I think it gives somewhat of a barrier to entry um, to people who want to rent here, or excuse me, who want to own a property here and rent. They might, you know, they need to be a good landlord. And I think that kind of gives you know, some second thought to some of the larger companies that come in here and buy a property and then, you know, fill it and don't do anything to improve it. So, and it, I think it's also going to give a good route for people to get a house, you know, to have their first home in North or not their first home, any home in North College Hill. Because that's my ultimate goal. I want to see, I don't want to have, you know, my renters, I don't want them to be there forever. As long, bad as that sounds for me, I want to see them, you know, eventually move out, start a family and, you know, have their own place. That's my ultimate goal for anyone that, you know, I rent to. And I think I want to say, well, actually by tripling it to $150, we're working in, again, a 25% margin. That's going to be a good amount of money to implement it and to start getting it going and to give it a little bit of a, a step behind. I think if you look at other municipalities too, I think um, that's not too much compared to other ones. Other cities have pretty high rental registration fees. Ours is pretty low. How did you come up with that number? And I mean, why why isn't it higher? It seems like it would be a little higher. Um, I think, I, you know, when we were looking at it, I think we were just looking for, you know, a, a good increase to the general fund amount and also a good increase, uh, a good amount for, you know, a first time home or home buyer program. So, I mean, for when I was looking at, when I, when I was initially researching this a while ago, you know, other cities have a lot higher fees, 100, 125. 
So I thought, I think 150 seems reasonable compared to other cities around us. So yeah, and currently right now we're getting roughly 30,000. So we would roughly be looking at $90,000 before any fees or fines if we just flattened out to where we are now. Yeah. And you know, that opens up $45,000. And I was telling Christian, even on a high end at $5,000 in a down payment match, that's eight families a year. Yeah. And I don't even think we really need to do 5,000. I think that's because you can get, you know, a home in North Cultural pretty affordably. And, you know, you don't, most home, if you're buying even if FHA or even a traditional mortgage, you don't need to put 20% down. You only really have to put around, you know, 3.5 or 5% down. So reasonably, you know, most people can get away with putting in North Carolina at least, you know, five, maybe six thousand dollars down. So if we meet up, match up to half of that, say three thousand, I think that's get people a house. Is there a, like a, another penalty if they're if they're late or if they don't pay? Yes. Yeah, it's in it's currently what we have. Okay. So in that though, I think so right now. I think it's hundred dollars. Is that what it is? Right now. No. Was it a hundred? Ah, I changed shit. Hold on. So right now it is. If they don't pay, um, fifty dollars. Oh no, that's one hundred and fifty. Sorry, my bad. Yeah. Okay, it was one hundred and fifty dollars. So under penalty and funds failure to register that was a hundred and fifty dollars i did change that one to two hundred and fifty dollars per property and then a hundred and fifty dollars every month that the property is not registered i mean if they're not registering it within six months that's just they're just that's neglect on their own like hopefully everybody just pays the hundred and fifty dollars initially like and not let it go on and on and on. But I think we should have severe penalties for sure. Sort of like the ethics committee. When you don't do them, you get that, is it 100 a day? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> is that what, what I'm thinking? I said, my, just sitting out there, I did it, but I didn't hit seeing. Is that May Oh, 15? our <laughs> ethics report. Yeah, no, I've never even oh, been no. close to that. Yep, no. Somebody says you got to do it, and I just do it. I think it's Maybe. like $100 a day or something. A but, you know, it would be nice. Not for me to make, make sure I do it. Yeah, Maybe I need they, to go hit sand. <laughs> no, the ethics commission. Can you waive our $35 fee during the COVID, please? Right, <laughs> yeah. right. So, <laughs> anyone want to move it out? I mean... Um, I mean, I think it's, I think we're good to move it out if everyone likes the, agrees with the amount. Did you, I, I, I agree, but did you send something about that? I don't, I don't have anything about that. So all you have is changing the chapter to reflect the new amounts. You don't have anything about the home buyers or grant program okay. because all of that needs to be done from the ground up to make sure it's correct. And that, and this gives us quite a few months to make sure that we go through that and make sure that that legislation is correct. All of, all this is doing is increasing the funds, but then we have to turn around and start writing the next piece to start it. And then who's going to fill the grants and how all of that's going to work. Yeah, like most likely we'll have to set up a separate fund for this to go into so that we can track it better. Um, it yeah. My question, did you send us like legislation even about uh, increasing the um, the fees? Yes, ma'am. That is, this is titled City of NCH 2020 legislation, um, cha amending chapter 1359. Okay. Okay, so I'm in my memory. I know when we, because this was recently changed because it used to be like $10. It was, it was recently so, changed. But to, I think we did, we did 
like there was a big rigmarole and there was a mm -hmm. meeting with the was that out because we wanted to be nice or was that a legal requirement that we had a public hearing and all that oh no my buddy matt wallard invited them the realtors association so that was just okay so we don't have to do anything where i'm going with that we can just i can i can check i'll double and triple check before i do bring it out i will do that yeah. for a public hearing on it um i don't think that that was a requirement no but we were being nice and it was a big freedom war it was a thing oh there was uh, yeah, I yeah, remember that one. And then we changed it yet again to include commercial businesses because at the time I said, why are we just charging residential businesses? Let's charge commercial businesses to see if we can't weed out some of the commercial owners on in North College that aren't using their buildings but renting them out. And so then we amended it again to add commercial Amber, you got real muffled. Are you holding your phone different? I can't hear you any at all anymore, Amber. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm on my computer because it's dark. Um, yeah, I'll check to see if we have to have a public hearing. I don't think that we have to. I think that was just being nice. Um, I just wanted to run it by you. Yes, ma'am. So are we are we to additional discussion? We are. What do you got? Um, well, since Miss Hall is on here, I was wondering if she has had any chance. I I heard some snippet somewhere during one of these COVID meetings that um, there was some money out there for municipalities that were getting less revenue during this time. So I didn't know if she had heard any of that or if she was looking into any of that or if anybody has any input. I heard uh, that too. Because uh, I, we're talking about the, the beauty district and all of those places are closed down. They're not making any revenue. So um, we know our revenue was going down, was already hurting. So I, I didn't know if, if there was any type of recouping any of that loss. As of right now, I don't know if you can hear me. This is yes. right. Okay. Yeah. Um, as of right now, I don't think that there is anything as far as reimbursing lost revenue. Um, Ron and I have been talking about um, FEMA reimbursing expenditure items from our public safety and potentially um, the state also reimbursing some of those expenditure items, but we are looking into that. Um, we did receive a uh, stimulus payment from HHS. That is not a um, like a reimbursement but it is a um, stimulus that went out to the cities. It went to the states, but then the states burst it to um, the cities based on population size. So I, I can speak from you know the city of Cincinnati. We also received the HSS payment um, just the other day, or was that today? I'm not sure. Um, and but. For the municipalities to get reimbursed for any type of expenses, it had to be a, meet a certain amount of population, and even the city of Cincinnati doesn't meet it because you know technically they only have three hundred thousand. I believe it was a five hundred thousand threshold. It oh. is. It is a five hundred thousand threshold. However, the county is receiving reimbursement of upwards of what four and a half billion, I think. I do. I did ask if we should write some kind of. Um, letter to the county showing our support that that gets evenly divided among municipalities but um you know i don't even do we even have an idea of what kind of deficit we're looking at has rita reported any of our like first earnings or because i know our gas tax is going to be lower earnings tax property taxes um do we have any idea of what we're collecting at right now? Um, yes, I 
we don't have an idea as to what that deficit is going to be. Okay. Um, it's too early to tell. And right now, um, as far as earnings taxes are concerned, we are doing better than last year as far as the amount we're collecting. Again, that could take a dive <laughs> because we're getting the amount of money that we're getting for the earnings tax is basically for the previous month. So um, the money that we just received this month in April is basically for March. So it's a reflection of basically the first quarter. So we don't know whether April and May, those could probably take a dive. We're not sure. There's no way for me to tell. I've looked through some reports that Rita gave me access to recently, and there's nothing that's at this time, you know, sign signaling like a red flag or anything. Um, I think you asked about another, oh, property taxes. We did just receive the first settlement for that. Um, that was about $888,000. Um, and I think that's about, I think those are all the major revenues that we just received. Um, and again, there's no way to tell how much lower those will go in the future, but I will definitely keep you all informed if we see anything. Cool. Thank and you. Then, have we, yeah, thank you so much, Ms. Ari. Have we, um, do we look like we're gonna be in a grim situation? I mean, cause we don't really have anybody to furlough, you know, like we're basically lean as it is right now, so. Um, again, it's, we, it's too early to tell whether we are going to have um, any um, problems with our revenue right now. We're bracing for impact right now. I know that the chiefs have worked with us to graciously look at expenditures that can be postponed for the year, um, you know, into the fall or into the winter. Um, just so that we can get an idea of what we can um, probably back away from as far as our expenditures are concerned if we start to notice that our revenues are taking a turn. So right now, I guess I can just say that we're in a place where we're looking very closely at our expenses and just keeping an eye on how things are trending right now. Oh, it's an open floor. Well, I would just like to say it's nice to see all of your faces as someone who's had to stay in the house for the last I don't know how long. So thank you all for coming in. And um, yeah, there we go. Miss Underwood, I have been in the house with my five-year-old son every day for the last three and a half weeks. <laughs> it's torture. <laughs> to say and I don't have little people. I have you want people. one? No. We've been social distancing. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Ms. Uh, Bailey. Yes, sir. There is one thing that um that I, I would like to bring up of course and that is um the tax budget. So um we went through this last year. However, it was asked of us um, if we could, you know, help out by perhaps preparing that uh, earlier. The tax budget is due in July. And so assuming that council will require three readings, if you work backwards, uh, the second reading would be June. And then the first reading would be the second week in May. And since we are already in April, that leaves one meeting, one finance committee meeting for you to look at the tax budget um, and then to put it on the calendar. Now, to, 
to be very clear, just so everyone understands, the tax budget, of course, is not the regular expense budget, although it will have expense numbers in it. It is basically uh, the, the process that we have to abide by with the county so that they will be able to record you know, our projected uh, tax revenues uh, from, the, from the county. And then of course, once that gets approved there, then you know, they send it back and then, and then we have to finalize it and send it back in October, I believe. It so, is draft number one. Rough, rough draft number one. Right. Um, so I'm just, I wanted to make sure that all of the committee knew um, and so that we can, because obviously I've already talked with Ari about it. You know, I said she's jumping already into the fire, but, and I know that we just, you just passed the regular budget, but you, but I, I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that this is something that we'll have to look at, um, at on during the next finance committee meeting. So if you would kindly put that on your agenda, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Yes, sir. That we'll have that. I'm sorry, say that again. When do you anticipate that we'll have that? I do not have a date as of yet. I'll need to talk with Ari, but Ms. Underwood, what we can do um, is to give, you know, send send an email to council, um, kind of giving you an idea okay. when it will be able to be out. I don't think, and I don't want to, I don't want to speak on her behalf, uh, but I don't think that it should be overly difficult because fortunately we do have you know, last year's uh, kind of as a base. So uh, so it should be a little bit easier for us to prepare it for this year. Um, I would like to say, Ms. Ari and Mr. Mosby, whenever it comes to finance like that, if you guys just want to send everybody the same document, um, that would be great. Like send it to the entire committee, not just me and Christian, just send it to everyone at the same time. Okay. But, that would that would be awesome like so the way they have it at the same time and i'm not relied i don't have whatever right but on the other hand um when do you think that we can see before when can we see like a financial report a monthly oh uh, now i'm going to turn it over to miss hall because i think <laughs> she might have something for you on that oh, yes sorry. actually i prepared that and finalize that at five o'clock today <laughs> cool. just did not send it out so I will definitely send that to everyone tomorrow morning and that way you can review that and um maybe even um for the next committee meeting maybe we can discuss that plus the um March um update as well as the tax budget if that's Absolutely. okay what what time frame does that what is the um financial? February? Okay, cool. Through February. Through February. Now, I think the good news um, ultimately is that, as Ms. Hall had said earlier, um, right now, um, as of February, our revenues had exceeded expectation, which was a which has been a good thing, and so we have been operating um, in you know in the black, so up to up to February. That was good, and I, um, uh, we won't. <laughs> I don't want to speak too much on March just yet, but um, before the next meeting, you know, we, you certainly she can present that to you, and then it, it'll, a full presentation can be given to the committee. Um, but Miss Hall, I think if you, as as Miss Bailey just said, if you could tomorrow just send that out to the members of council so that they'll have that document. Um, so it'll include the reconciliation. It'll include uh, the expenditures, so that you could you could see that for uh, through the month of February. Cool. So, anybody else, or are we cool for a quick recap? Okay, so we're going to submit the ODOT resolution. We're going to submit the OWPC resolution. We're going to submit the rental registration all to council. We are sleeping on the fire equipment fund and we are sleeping on the bag tax. 
However, we are also going to draft a letter asking Mr. Mosby to get a fair selling price on the Dallas Avenue house. And our next meeting, we're gonna talk about the preliminary tax budget. Oh yes, uh, Ms. Bailey, one other thing. You sent this to us and, and maybe everyone saw it, but um, I d actually the Ohio Public Works Commission also um, basically suspended a the uh, most the, the upcoming payment that would be due actually postponed it so that we won't have to make that semi annual payment in July until January of next of of twenty twenty one so I do think that is something that the members of the committee should be aware of. Yes, sir. And thank you for reminding me once again, another call for it. If you guys do not get the Ohio Municipal League legislative bulletins, you need to, I will send you the link. Just let me know. <laughs> and I am going to put a, a plug into a gentleman who I have a very high regard for, Tom Carroll, who is the village administrator for the village of Silverton. And uh, he was actually the one that, that really pushed this. So uh, we so we are the beneficiaries of his hard work, and I'd like to thank him for that. Good, and they're doing a lot of stuff right now on like on behalf of us as far as local governments and municipalities go. And I've been reaching out to see if there's anything that we need to say that we need to support or any legislation that we need to get moving on to make sure that we do get adequate funding and that we can pay our bills. Because, yeah, as a city, it's kind of scary right now. So if anybody sees anything that looks like it that we need to do immediately in regards to our finances, please call me and we will have a special finance committee meeting and get it out and get it done. Because as we know, stuff is changing every hour on the hour during this mess. So. It is, but I will tell you that once again, you know, uh, the mayor has already taken some very uh, assertive action. And as Ms. Hall had said earlier, we have already uh, begun looking at areas where we can uh, postpone payments. We have reduced our expenses to only the essentials. Um, and so we're, we're, as she said before, and I appreciate how she said it, we're basically bracing uh, for impact right now. But I can definitely assure you that uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. Chief Fells and Chief Schrand uh, went through each of their budgets and uh, really did. They really scrubbed them, scrubbed them very, very well so that we would be able to preserve uh, as many funds as we can. I was really... Um... I don't want to use the word impress, but I was really moved by the things that they took out and decided to um, prolong an order in case that we do run into an issue. Um, and we've only, like there's no training. Um, I know the chief has removed his um, evening clerks already. That was one thing he had already done. So- Get out now. <laughs> sorry, I sorry guys. I put the I put the video not on, but sorry, <laughs> my bad. What's it? motherhood? Did I mention it's been three weeks with him? <laughs> I got a boxer to keep coming in here looking at me, and I keep giving him <laughs> evil eye. Like, don't even come over here. <laughs> so you know, he's. I just was the the cuts. They're hard, but um, necessary, I believe. So we're just trying to pre-plan ahead, look at how things go. We're really waiting on March financials to see how everything goes before we make any decisions. Also a bright note, um, and I'll, I'll share it here, but uh, I really would like to thank the Cloverna Country Club. They were very kind and uh, this past Good Friday, uh, they prepared meals for the police and the fire, um, so they were able to they were able to enjoy a succulent supper of fish 
and I think a couple of them had cheeseburgers as well. So, uh, and I and uh, the president or the chair of the board told me that they plan on doing it again for the next couple of Fridays. So I, I am very grateful for their contribution. Um, and, I, and I just think it's a wonderful example, once again, of you know, community partnership. Can I get one of those uh, sticker badges so I can go eat over there? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Whoever has the pager, do you need a battery? Sounds it's like not a pager. That's my that's my house alarm. I forgot to mute it. <laughs> it sounds to... like a pager. I'm like, it, it's COVID, okay? Like, sorry. <laughs> it does like sound like a out. pager. And I switched the battery from the downstairs. That's why it's keep it keeps beeping. It hasn't picked up that I switched it. So generally, it talks. It'll tell you um, basement battery something. Sorry. <sighs> I'm used to it. I don't even hear it anymore. You know the thing. I don't even hear it. You remember those? You remember those commercials when um they used to say, "This is your brain on drugs. <laughs> this is your leadership on social distancing." <laughs> like, all right. Do we have anything else? Because we are way over time. We yeah. are, but we're productive. So we good? Yeah. Adjourned. Adjourned. All right. Good night, y'all. Good night. night. night.